Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Seeds and Weeds podcast, brought to you by Small House Farm. If you're looking to celebrate plants and the people that love them, then this is the podcast for you. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Bevan Cohen. Hello again, my friends. Welcome back to the show. Today, we're going to be sitting down with Crystal Stevens for a round of Ask an Herbalist. You sent us your questions about herb gardening and herbal medicine, and Crystal's going to answer them right here on the show. Crystal Stevens is an incredible herbalist, and she's the owner of Flourish Farmstead in Godfrey, Illinois. It's a real honor to have her on the show with us today. I'm just super excited that she's here. Before we get into the interview, I want to talk a little bit about herbs and oils and herb-infused oils. You know, things are really kicking off in the gardens here at Small House. Uh, we've been starting to bring in quite a harvest of things. Of course, we got nettles and comfrey. Just yesterday, I noticed that all the elder are starting to bloom. We're going to start bringing that in. And as we're bringing these fresh herbs in to dry, we need to start making room by clearing out what's left over from last year's gardens. The herbs sort of move through stages, you know. There's the freshly harvested plants that come in from the gardens and they're going out on the screens to dry. Once they're dried, they're garbled and packaged up for storage. That's the next stage. And then from here, the herbs begin their journey into becoming products. Some of the herbs are blended into teas, others are infused into oils, which later become salves and lotions and balms. And then some of the herbs, they're infused into alcohols and vinegar. Then they either head from there into the family medicine cabinet, or they're shipped out to customers all over the country. So it's quite a journey, really. Now, as these herbs are coming in, I need to start taking stock of what I have already in dry storage. If they're stored well, of course, these herbs are going to keep for some time, but I don't have space to store them all. So what I have in storage needs to move on to the next phase of the cycle. You know, the yarrow and comfrey from last year's garden, it's going into sunflower oil now, and it'll eventually become the healing salve that we offer through the small house site. It's great for bruises and scratches and abrasions. It's a really nice salve. You know, I was just recently on the Pantry Chat podcast with Carolyn from Homesteading Families. It was a super fun interview, and we got to talk about oil pressing, which is something that we've been doing here at Small House for years. It was a really cool conversation. You know, seed and nut oils are something that many of us use every single day. But when folks are talking about sustainable living or do-it-yourself lifestyles, nobody ever seems to be talking about seed and nut oils. But it's a staple food, and you can't have a local food system without local staples. So I was really thankful that Carolyn invited me onto the show to talk about oil pressing. And folks have really responded to it, too. I've been getting emails from people all over the country that want to learn more about pressing their own oils right at home. It's been so exciting to see. There's certainly been an uptick in orders for copies of my book, The Complete Guide to Seed and Nut Oils. You know, we offer it in a little bundle deal. Uh, the book comes with the press that we use, and it's just been super cool knowing that other people are finally getting interested in producing their own oils. So needless to say, it has been a very exciting couple of weeks here at Small House Farms. Now, while we're on that topic, I want to give a shout out to all the new people that have recently joined the Patreon. We're so thankful for all of your support. And there is quite a list of new patrons, too. Ready for this? Big thanks to Charity H, Jeffrey L, Andrea B, Donna S, Joe P, Susan B, Lemoyne Han M, Wendy R, Regina T, Nancy M, Rebecca S, and Terry R. Thank you all so much for supporting the podcast and our small farm. We really appreciate each and every one of you. Now, for those of you out there that are looking for a fun and economical way to support the show, check out our Patreon page. There's lots of great benefits for members on there. Seasonal gift baskets, all sorts of groovy things. You can find that link in our show notes or at seedsandweedspodcast.com. Now, let's get back to talking about these herbal oils. I would mentioned yarrow and comfrey. These two herbs, and really most of the herbs that we're going to combine with oil, should be dried first, right? So I'll put them out on screens. I'll put a fan on them to help them dry down real quick. Then I'll combine the yarrow and comfrey 50-50. Now here I'm using the comfrey leaves, but for the yarrow, I'm using both the leaves and the flowers. I'll combine them in a quart jar, and then I'll fill that jar to the top with some real nice sunflower oil. You know, sunflower oil is high in vitamin E which is an essential skin nutrient. So it's going to be perfect for the product that we're making here. Then we're going to take a chopstick or something and stir it up just to get the air bubbles out of it. And we cap it, label it, and place it in a cool, dark location for around four to six weeks. Once they're ready, strain out the herbs and you'll have your beautiful herbal oil. You can use it topically just like it is, or you can blend it with beeswax to craft it into a lotion or a salve. Now, everyone has a different formula for crafting a salve, uh, but I'll give you a really easy one here. This is from my book, The Artisan Herbalist. It's a great ratio of oil to beeswax to get you started. And then you can just adjust it from there to your own preferences. You know, if the salve isn't as stiff as you'd like it, add more beeswax. Too stiff? Add more oil, right? Real simple. All right, now, for every 16 fluid ounces of herbal oil, add one and a quarter ounces of beeswax by weight. I'll say it again. For 16 fluid ounces of herbal oil measured in volume, add one and a quarter ounces of beeswax measured by weight. 
I'll use a digital scale to measure the beeswax and then combine both of the ingredients into a double boiler and put it over a low heat. As that oil warms up, the beeswax will melt and then you can give it a good stir to make sure it's well blended and then pour it into containers to cool. And that's it. Simple stuff. Now, you've taken herbs from your garden and freshly cold pressed oils and created a healing topical salve that's great for cuts and scratches, bruises and abrasions. That's pretty cool, huh? You can find that recipe that we just made written out down in the show notes. And if you'd like to explore more herbal medicine, check out my book, The Artisan Herbalist, which is available at smallhousefarm.com. All right, let's get on to that interview. Crystal Stevens is a bioregional herbalist, educator, author, and artist. She co-owns Flourish Farmstead with her husband, Eric, and their two children along the bluffs of the mighty Mississippi River. Today, Crystal is joining us for a segment of Ask an Herbalist. Crystal Stevens, I'm so excited to have you with us here today. Welcome to the show. Thank you. What an honor it is. Thank you so much. So today we're going to be doing Ask an Herbalist, which has become one of our most popular segments. Folks send these questions in that they would like to ask an herbalist. But before we get into that, could you tell our listeners just a little bit more about who you are and the work that you do? Sure. So I've been studying medicinal herbs since 1997. I have a 10-acre farm in Godfrey, Illinois, where I grow mostly medicinal herbs and run an herb school here in the Midwest along the bluffs of the Mississippi River. We teach people how to make tinctures and teas and salves, and uh, they get to take home a lot of medicinal herbs from the farm to dry. And we also make herbal products. That's awesome. So let's chat a little bit about Flourish Farmstead. Now there's a folk school, there's a botanical sanctuary, you're doing these wild food dinners, workshops. It sounds like a pretty awesome place. Yeah, it's it's very quaint. Uh, It's 10 acres, mostly wooded. So we do a lot of agroforestry and mushrooms and a lot of at-risk and rare herbs in the woodland areas. And we have a little creek at the bottoms that we're trying to uh, revitalize some uh, at-risk plant species such as golden seal and ginseng. Oh, yeah, I totally dig it. That's awesome. Okay, let's get right into these questions because there's a lot of them and quite a variety of different things that people sent in. So the first question is from Beth Sexton. Beth asks, what is the best time to harvest herbs and what's the best way to dry them for storage? Well, uh, it really depends on each specific herb. So there's many herbs that you harvest when they're flowering, such as Tulsi. You know, obviously, if you're harvesting flowers such as calendula, you'll want to get them right in their flowering stage. And once you notice them flower, you really need to be very set up and efficient with your harvesting process. You need to have somewhere to go with them, whether it be drying in uh, air dry racks or a food dehydrator. I have a sort of a rough harvesting calendar. Now, it fluctuates with the seasons and it fluctuates every year. For instance, uh, I thought my elderflowers would be blooming late June this year based on the last three years, but they bloomed early June this year. So I um, had a whole elderflower festival planned for this weekend and the elderflowers are mostly already bloomed. Oh no. But that's all right. We're pivoting and having a solstice gathering instead. But the other thing to think about is to harvest in the morning hours before it gets too hot and after the dew has lifted. So for the herbaceous herbs, I like to harvest around 10 a.m. before it gets too hot. You know, you'll have to research for each herb. So really when the plant looks at its prime, so all the culinary herbs, when they look really nice, that's when you should harvest. That's an easy one. Now, what's the best way to dry some of these herbs? I have multiple ways of drying. So um, we have a greenhouse and sometimes I utilize the greenhouse on a dry day to bulk dry a lot of herb. Or I have these um, mesh drying racks that I really love that have about 12 tiers to them and they zip up so that the insects don't get them. And then my tried and true little um, food dehydrators work really well. Okay. So now our friend Rita from Willisburg, Kentucky, she wants to know what herbs would you recommend for making a salve or lotion for aging skin? Hmm, That's a good one. So um, I like to grow and forage most of the herbs that I use in my herbal products. I use a lot of calendula oil. Um, Mullen is really nice for the skin, chamomile. Um, I also grow a lot of turmeric and ginger. And I have a creek that has horsetail equisetum nearby. So a lot of those are really nice for the skin. And elderflower. Elderflower is one of my favorite for um, improving the elasticity of the skin. As our base oils, we'd like to use uh, vitamin E oil, jojoba 
jojoba oil, rosehip seed oil, and I've been experimenting with um, making my own wild grapeseed extract. All of those combined make really lovely face oils or serums or salves or creams. Okay. Now, we had a ton of questions that people sent in about tinctures. So the first tincture related question, Crystal, is, is there a way to make a tincture without using alcohol? And is it as effective? I guess that's two questions. There's multiple menstruums that can be used for tincture making. Other than alcohol, my preferred method is to make an oxymel. Uh, basically, you would infuse the herbs or extract the herbs in apple cider vinegar. Now, I will use this precaution with apple cider vinegar. It's important to have a plastic lid or uh, some sort of parchment paper or wax paper in between the canning lid jar and the jar itself. And there's also a preparation you can use with glycerin. You can make a glycerin extract. That is done just by infusing the herbs in glycerin. Now, there are specific ratios follow, and there are some dilution components to keep in mind. But glycerin and apple cider vinegar are really nice ways to make an alcohol-free tincture. For folks that are making tinctures at home, this is our next question. How do we know the proper dosage for a handcrafted tincture? Yeah, it really varies uh, based on whether you're using roots, barks, berries, or herbaceous leaves. You would really want to do a refined search to find out the proper dosage per plant. But as a general rule, um, if you're using things that are safe for most people. And if the person is not on any pharmaceutical medication, I would say the standard dosage is three dropper fools up to three times a day. But if it's something like a bitter, uh, that would be just a taste um, because you just need the taste of the bitter to activate the saliva and the digestive enzymes. So it depends on the precise herb you're using as well as the herbal action that you're trying to initiate. So sometimes we like to dilute our tinctures in tea or water or something like that, either um, to make it more palatable or whatever it might be. Does diluting tincture in hot tea impact its effectiveness? It depends on how hot the tea is. I, I would say if you just pour your boiling cup and it's still, you know, actively <laughs> bubbling or steaming, um, let it cool down before you add your tincture. But I would say that adding a tincture to a tea that's borderline hot is a great way to take tinctures. What are some of your favorite uses for elderflower tincture? Ooh. Well, elderflower has so many amazing medicinal uses, but my two favorite um, herbal actions that elderflower has is as an antiviral. So it's amazing. Well, three favorite. As an antiviral, so cold and flu symptoms, a lot of respiratory issues that you might be suffering, um, elderflower tincture is going to be very beneficial for cold and flu. It's also a diaphoretic herb, so it helps to lower a fever. It induces sweat and makes you sweat a little more so you can break your fever faster. And then it's also a powerful anti-inflammatory. Sinuses, um, allergies, seasonal allergies as an anti-inflammatory. It really works with the upper respiratory tract to give that wonderful anti-inflammatory effect. Nice. Now I want to follow up. Uh, earlier you used the word menstruum. So for the listeners at home, could you um, explain what you meant by that? Yes. The menstruum in tincture making and tincture making 101 would be the liquid that you put your botanicals in, whether it be roots, barks, berries, or leaves or flowers into the liquid. And the liquid could either be alcohol or gin or brandy or Everclear, or you can um, use apple cider vinegar or glycerin. Excellent. Now, I know, Crystal, that you have written a number of wonderful books. Um, so could we just talk about your books really quick and maybe one that our uh, herb curious friends at home might really appreciate uh, purchasing and reading? Oh, thank you. Um, well, uh, I have three. And the one that I, I adore the most is Your Edible Yard because it has full color photos of very amazing medicinal herbs that you can grow easily in your own yard to create your edible and medicinal oasis. You said edible and medicinal oasis from our own backyard. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like the greatest book ever. <laughs> Thank you. And I assume that this book, um, give us the title again and tell us where it's available. Your Edible Yard. And it should be available through any library database. So you could request it at your own public library. I sell the books on my website at flourishfarmstead.com. That is awesome. I'm going to put some links in the show notes so folks can check that out. And that brings us to the end of the questions already. Crystal, thank you so much for being our expert herbalist today. Thank you so much for having me. So now for folks that want to connect with you and Flourish Farmstead, give us all the links that they're 
they're going to need to know? Sure. Our website is flourishfarmstead.com. We've got an online store at shop.growcreateinspire.com. We are um, Flourish Farmstead on Etsy, Flourish Farmstead on Facebook, and Flourish underscore Farmstead on Instagram. Fantastic. And those links are all going in the show notes too. Crystal, thank you again for being on the podcast with us today and sharing all of your wisdom. That was totally awesome. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. And that's the end of the show, my friends. Thank you so much for tuning in. And big thanks to Crystal Stevens for joining us today. If you'd like to send in your questions for Ask an Herbalist, feel free to contact us anytime through our website. You'll find that link down in the show notes. This episode was edited and produced by all of us here at Small House Farm. If you'd like to support the show, remember, you can always subscribe to our Patreon. You can find that link and many more at seedsandweedspodcast.com. The music you're listening to right now is Spy Jazz from Sergei Quattrato. I'm your host, Bevan Cohen, and we'll see you next time.